Okay, perfect. You're now live streaming. Well, it looks like we're live streaming to us a slightly. Okay, perfect. You're now live streaming. We're right at two, everyone. Should we let people in? No. Or we're at two, but uh, Alana Coleman, should we let people in? We're ready. All right, we're going to begin admitting people. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to uh, welcome you to uh, this afternoon's uh, session. This is something that I have been so uh, excited about for weeks, and uh, I'm so happy you're with us today. I'm Gary Moore. I am your NACO president. I'm also the county judge executive, the elected county executive in Boone County, Kentucky, which is part of the greater Cincinnati region. And uh, furthermore, I was the NACO chair of the Opioid Task Force back a few years ago. Uh, you might recall that there were 10 county officials and 10 city officials uh, from around the country. So it was a joint venture between NACO and National League of Cities. The mayor of Little Rock, Arkansas at the time was the NLC chair and I was the NACO chair. And some of you on the call today were probably part of that task force. So it occurred to me that as I was hearing more and more about uh, what was going on with these potential settlements, I thought it was time we reconvene and share some best practices. So welcome to NACO's National Multi-Jurisdiction Opioid Litigation Settlement Forum. I had to read that. Uh, National Multi-District Opioid Litigation Settlement Forum. Uh, the meeting is being recorded. So we are gonna be able to play this back for those that can't join us for any or maybe part of what we're gonna be talking about today. And this will be posted at NACO.org. So um, I do wanna remind you to keep your microphones muted during the meeting uh, so that we can uh, keep uh, discussion going and be respectful to our panelists. We will be taking Q&A in the chat box and uh, that will be how we will interact and, and do Q&A. Uh, so you can uh, do that on your uh, Zoom toolbar. Uh, if you need technical assist assistance, please drop a note into the chat box and uh, we can get you help there. Our NACO staff and, and uh, very qualified team will be working there. So back to my opening comments, you know, uh, I'm just reminded way too often as to how this, how this uh, drug use disorder and uh, dependency 
uh, the mental health component of it, how it continues to impact our community. My wife and I, we walk uh, from our home through a community and there's a cemetery uh, on the edge of it. It's a beautiful, it's always uh, uh, so well kept, uh, beautiful flowers. And I walk by a headstone of a young lady that was just 22 years old. And that's the first one, first person I can recall here in Boone County that OD uh, from opioids. And uh, her mom works for our post Welcome office to do. here in town. And I see, I see her mom often and I'm reminded of how, Enter many, your meeting ID, followed by pound. how many families have been impacted by this this uh, horrific problem through the years. And it's appropriate that now with the years of work that has been done, that uh, we're starting to find that uh, the companies are entering into settlement discussions and we all have different stories. The states you're gonna hear from today have a variety of uh, different scenarios. Uh, here in Kentucky years ago, our attorney general at the time settled with the manufacturers and signed away the county's rights to sue based on manufacturers and a, a, a certain category of manufacturer. So our litigation here in Kentucky is primar primarily around the distributors. And uh, that's where a lot of the national settlement talk is occurring today. So uh, I don't wanna keep uh, talking and take away time from our panelists, but I think we're gonna hear today that because of the mental health uh, that is uh, the, the level of mental health concerns that are stored up because of the pandemic and the stresses of the pandemic, coupled with the fact that we're, there are a lot of estimates that we're gonna see a much heavier flow of supply of uh, heroin, uh, other illicit drugs and, uh, and prescription abuse in the coming months. Uh, I think this is a very timely uh, subject and I'm going to just jump right into it without further ado. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt Chase, our Executive Director of NACO, to set up the first panel. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Judge Moore. And thank you for your personal leadership, both, as you said, as co-chair of the NACO National League of Cities Opiate Task Force, but also as your tenure as president of the Kentucky Association of Counties and now the National Association of Counties. Your personal engagement in this, including your leadership, helping negotiate with your Kentucky Attorney General and, and other county officials on an interstate settlement. What we're gonna to start today is kind of a landscape review. We're gonna be joined here by Stephen Aquario, the Executive Director of the New York State Association of Counties, someone who has many years of experience on this topic, as well as was a key figure back in the day helping the New York State Association of Counties negotiate with the state on the tobacco settlement. So Steve was very instrumental in actually securing $6 billion for New York State counties in the tobacco settlement, and then applying those lessons learned with the opiate settlement. He is gonna go through kind of what we call the multi-layered landscape of the federal and state lawsuits, where we are in the process of all these different moving pieces. And he'll kick us off with kind of, again, that general landscape review. So Stephen Aquario, thank you again for your leadership, not only in New York, but also coordinating the other state associations of counties around this, the nation and making sure that we're sharing information and really working as a network on this topic. So Stephen, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Matt Chase. Uh, thank you for having me here today and thank you to all the county officials and state association directors and staff that are with us here. You know, I, uh, I want to, uh, before I get into some comments, uh, I want to thank Judge Moore, Gary Moore of Boone County, Kentucky. Leadership that he's shown in opioids and substance abuse uh, is self-evident. When he got a handle of, of this issue, he, he brought the county leaders from across the United States together. And uh, one of our county officials, uh, Mark Polencars from Erie County, New York, was a member of the Opioid Task Force. Uh, instrumental in helping shape NACO policy. And I did want to thank you very, very much, Judge Moore. I'd also want to acknowledge uh, the county executive in uh, Suffolk County, Steve Ballone, uh, one of the first to file uh, a lawsuit in New York State uh, in 2016. And the last acknowledgement I want to say is to Dan McCoy, the Albany County Executive, 
who is the leader of the County Executives of America, also put an awful lot of work into this issue of opioid litigation. So we had a few county officials in New York, very instrumental. I've got a PowerPoint here. The, the first slide here talks about a national multi-district opioid litigation. And I wanna just say uh, lessons learned from America's county leaders. When we unite, we have power. When we come together, we can bring attention to a particular issue. We did it in tobacco. Uh, we're doing it in opioids right now, thanks to all of you from around the United States that are part of this effort. Uh, and even if you're not part of this effort on this call, hopefully uh, you can understand what this means in your community and be able to try to allocate some of these funds that might come via uh, the state that you're in or through the county that you're in with an allocation from the state and just how important this is gonna be in our communities. Uh, if we continue to do this together, we can truly effectuate change. I'm working on another one right now in water contamination uh, through PFAS uh, contamination, PFOS and PFOA used in manufacturing and firefighting call. But when we get together and when we unite, we can truly effectuate change. Next slide. So this presentation here for a few minutes is gonna talk about the status of the opioid litigation uh, how it's uh, being effectuated in the United States, uh, in, in federal court and in state court. Uh, and if we could just move this slide one, if we're able to do that, Jenny, uh, we'll, we'll get underway here. But a lot of activity recently talking about uh, the MDL. Uh, as Gary uh, Judge Moore mentioned, Matt Chase mentioned, there's an MDL pending right now. Why now? Why did Matt Chase and Gary Moore want to bring us all together. Well, there's a sort of a buzz happening right now, and we'll get into that in a few minutes about what that buzz is. But you start off here with this MDL number 2804. This is the Consolidated Multi-District Litigation. Multi-district simply means there are multiple federal, federal courts, district courts, where this litigation was being filed. And if we go to the next slide. Uh, one, one back, Jim. Yep, thank you. So just to give you a rough snapshot here, these are state attorney general's cases, the states who got involved. Uh, you can see the different types here on this slot of filing against one company, uh, Purdue, or another one, or manufacturers only, as Judge Moore was mentioning what was happening in Kentucky. He would be in the red, manufacturers maybe, big distributors, uh, different types of states filed in different manners. Uh, against different defendants. And if we go to the next slide here, you can see it gets even more complicated here with this multi-district litigation. Uh, this may have changed, but this was a snapshot in time of what the states were doing about a year ago or so. Uh, and if you look in New York, where I'm from, fe federal in federal court, 15 counties filed there, but all 58 filed in state court. So in our court, it was state court. Uh, and, and, and you can look around the various uh, states. Uh, if you look at Arkansas, for instance, 91, the vast majority file in state court. But if you shift up north from Arkansas to Wisconsin, you could see one case filed in state court, but the vast majority filed in Wisconsin into federal court, which created this multi-district litigation. And then that was all transferred into the next slide, if you will, Jen, into the uh, Judge Polster now handling this multi-district litigation in the state of Ohio. So this chart here, this uh, slide here is talking about uh, the MDL procedure, uh, Cuyahoga and Summit County on the eve of this federal trial uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Ohio here uh, settled. And so two counties who hopefully will be hearing uh, from later on in this presentation here, we'll hear what happened to them on their proceeds of this settlement. That case did not go to trial, but uh, after that was uh, settled on the eve of trial, it began to have a buzz about, well, what about other counties? And a scramble began to occur about how do we move forward? What happened with Cuyahoga and Summit and try to effectuate that settlement with others. And then uh, from that, uh, we started to see what was called a class action. Uh, settlement was proposed by Judge and approved by Judge Polster 
uh, but ultimately struck down. And I'll talk about that in a minute about that class action settlement that was happened. So CT means case tracker. So that was the first case tracker, number one, Cuyahoga and Summit, case tracker number two now, a trial coming up in West Virginia uh, in May of 2021. Again, these dates are very important because as you begin to approach these dates, oftentimes defendants will approach plaintiffs and try to negotiate settlement agreements. So a big trial coming up for the big three distributors in the state of West Virginia uh, coming up in May of 2021. And then uh, you see uh, the uh, case tracker number three, a trial of the third bellwether group against a retail, a retail chain pharmacies. This is all pursuant to the MDL governed by Judge Polster in Ohio. That's scheduled for later in the year in October of 2021. The next slide, Judge Polster has also remanded uh, to different federal courts around the United States uh, in Illinois uh, for a manufacturer trial and in San Francisco for a pharmacy and a manufacturer trial. So the judge remanded, he's keeping pharmacy for October in, uh, in Ohio, but he remanded to two other courts around the United States, a manufacturer case and a, a pharmacy and manufacturing case in San Francisco. The judge as we know it is not, uh, is not remanding any other cases at this time in the foreseeable future. Go to the next slide. So uh, a lot of states sued Purdue. Purdue one of being one of the largest manufacturers here of opioids, uh, filed for bankruptcy, as many of you might know, in New York bankruptcy in September of 2019. Uh, reports coming out in October of 2020, the media reporting an $8.3 billion settlement with the federal government. 225 million going to the federal government, 8 billion to thousands of states, local governments and other entities, guilty plea of three felonies and a Purdue company reorganization plan as part of this settlement. For those of you on this recording now or those that might listen later, it's very important for you to discuss the Purdue pharmacy uh, settlement and these numbers of 8 billion going to states and local governments and other entities, as that issue remains unclear as to how that will be distributed and if that will be distributed to the counties in your state, which is of course of paramount concern to those of us participating in this webinar. In New York, it remains unclear how any allocation from the Purdue settlement will come to the New York counties despite the fact that the New York counties filed litigation against them. Again, this is coming through the bankruptcy proceeding and not through the federal or state courts. Next slide, please. So lots of other reports coming out. And again, as Judge Moore mentioned uh, up, uh, up front at the beginning of this webinar and Matt Chase mentioned, a lot of discussions and a lot of buzz going around right now uh, Perhaps those of you that are watching this now are in fact negotiating or talking with your attorney generals. Uh, and here's why. Uh, the Washington Post reported, again, I'm using media here because these documents have not been released uh, officially, have reported that the big three distri distributors, McKesson, Cardinal Health, and Amerisource Bergen, and Johnson & Johnson have negotiated a roughly $26 billion settlement to be paid over 18 years. And that is important for all of us to understand. This is a long-term structured settlement. Uh, McKesson, Cardinal Health, Amer America, Source Bergen, and Johnson Johnson, which is a manufacturer. These negotiations remain ongoing, but this is why we're con being convened here today, because it could be coming to a, a, a state where you are and the counties and your outside council, council and your attorneys general all being discussing this right now. So very important for you to be engaging uh, with, your, with your attorney general and certainly with your outside counsel. Next slide, please. So uh, for Purdue, Purdue bankruptcy settlement, again, the media has been reporting uh, the offer uh, here is four to five billion nationally uh, being allocated to a class negotiation model. And again, unless a county has a different deal with the state, that alters these allocation metrics, 
uh, this formula will be used. And uh, this is the plan being put out uh, by, uh, by the bankruptcy court and will most likely be voted on. But again, a lot of negotiations are still undergoing. The class negotiation model that was put out uh, by the MDL class negotiation model, that's what we're talking about here. So unless you're structuring something different within your state, the default will likely be the class negotiation model. And that might be using a tri-factor formula of population, number of opioid pills that were shipped into your state and uh, the numbers of opioid use disorders or things of that nature that develop that class negotiation model. So very important for counties to be talking with their attorneys, their attorneys general about uh, either a state specific model or, or if in fact it's gonna be the, uh, the default mechanism here uh, uh, of the class negotiation model. Okay, next slide. Again, reading media reports, not official. Uh, another reason why Matt and Gary Moore, Judge Moore wanted to get us together is another settlement. So we have Purdue, you have the distributor settlement, 26 billion, you have Purdue, uh, four, five, six, eight billion dollars coming out of Purdue. And now we're seeing another structured settlement being released here. Media reports again, $600 million settlement with 40 state attorneys general. Of note here and importance to the counties, the states are expected to keep the proceeds to address the harms caused by and recoup the cost of investigating McKinsey's role with Purdue Pharma in marketing opioids. The media reports indicate McKinsey will turn over internal documents detailing its work with Purdue. Again, this is the first multi-state opioid settlement. Uh, the media report reporting Washington State, West Virginia, keeping separate settlement agreements in place. Some counties I know in New York have filed claims against McKinsey and New York State, just to give you a, a, an idea about what is likely to be distributed from this is expected to receive about $32 million from this multi-state structured settlement. I bring this up because again, it is unclear how the counties will share in this structured settlement with McKinsey as they have structured a settlement with the attorneys general and not with the counties. So First question to ask your outside counsel, did we file against McKinsey? I know in New York State, our counsel, Napoli Skolnick, did file against McKinsey. And so we would be looking to recoup some of the costs of this structured settlement or a separate allocation from them for the county shares. Next slide, please. So what happened to the multi-district litigation? Why are things moving in different directions here uh, with the distributors and with McKinsey and with Purdue. Well, we talked about what happened to Purdue. Purdue filed for bankruptcy. So that took that out of the multi-district lit district litigation and the distributors uh, choosing to negotiate for the most part with the attorneys general and seeing if they couldn't structure an agreement outside of the MDL, uh, ultimately bringing in the county's outside counsel and they have been talking but what happened to the MDL class action? So this slide talking about the MDL court approved a request to certify a class action, setting forth a framework to assist the court and the parties to achieve a national resolution. That decision was challenged in the Sixth Circuit by the distributors in a group of six Ohio cities. The uh, appellate court reversed the district court's order and decertified the class. A petition for a hearing on bonk has been filed and the formula at the heart of this class model remains, though, as part of the active settlement discussions. Lots of moving parts and pieces here, but it was a lot of good work, a lot of goodwill that came about from Judge Polster certifying a class action because it ultimately created a class model, uh, a formula for trying to come up with a fair and equitable distribution amongst the states around the United States, first of all, and then a second cut of the different allocations or intrastate allocations between the state and the counties therein. Next slide, please. So allocation agreements. Uh, 
agreements are these agreements are designed to distribute potentially potential settlement funds quickly and efficiently. That's why Matt Chase, Gary Moore wanted to get us all together. If counties in the state don't have an agreement, there's your default right there. You're likely to see a 15% county local share, a 15% state share, and a 70% abatement fund. An abatement fund. Now you'll notice here these are uh, this abatement fund, these proceeds, unlike tobacco, are going to be earmarked and dedicated. But unless you reach some sort of allocation agreement within your state, this is generally going to be the allocation 15, 15, 70. Most of the agreements are within this framework. These three guiding principles. One, a direct percentage to the counties, certain towns, villages, and or cities, depending on who filed. Mostly it's the counties. Two, a direct percentage to a private foundation, a board, committee, or council dedicated to funding these abatement efforts. And three, a direct percentage being dispersed to the state. Next slide, please. So as we, as I get towards uh, the, the time I've, alloc I've been allocated here, I did want to uh, just end on uh, this slide here where it's talking about at the end of the day, whatever we are able to secure, whatever we are able to structure as part of a settlement, if this is approved by the counties, if this is approved by the state, these funds by and large uh, must be used for what's called approved uses. This slide talks about treatment, opioid use disorder, supportive people in treatment and recovery, connecting people who need help to the help they need, addressing the needs of the criminal justice involved persons, address the needs of pregnant and parenting women and babies. Next slide, please. So the first slide was treatment. Next bucket is prevention. Prevent, preventing overprescribing and dispensing, preventing misuse of opioids, pre preventing overdose deaths and other harm reduction. Next slide, please. And then other strategies, so prevention, treatment and other strategies earmarked for first responders, uh, leadership planning and coordination, uh, research and uh, uh, post-mortem, your coroners and all the work of your medical examiners and the pressure it put on the local government uh, uh, impact of other, uh, in other strategies designed to uh, prevent this from happening and other strategies uh, to reduce the use of opioid use disorders and things of that nature. Uh, for us, it will probably be hundreds of individual categories that fit under these three buckets. So again, your allocation agreements, very important for you to negotiate something off of that 15, 15, 70. You're free to negotiate anything you want. You got to get the parties to all agree. Your default is likely that 15, 15, 70, unlike tobacco, this is for approved uses. And uh, I think that that'll take up the time I have. Matt, I'd like to take a few questions if there is any. And then I'd just like to say, I'd like to thank all of you around the United States for engaging on this. I think working together, we can bring about change. I'd like to thank our outside counsel, Napoli Skolnick, uh, for all the great work that they're doing and uh, bringing about change uh, in the MDL and in the state of New York and its cases. And Simmons Hanley, who also represents many of the counties in the state of New York and for the great work that they're doing as well. So Matt Chase, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. And we will put your slides in the chat, if that is okay. That was a great overview, great presentation. One quick question, what do you think co-responder models might be supported? Um, these are hard to fund in, trends, in traditional ways. Any response to that? I didn't hear the first part, Matt. Can you repeat the question? Under other strategies, do you think co-responder models might be supported? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, without question. Uh, for instance, I'm not sure if this is where the question is directed at, but in New York, we're going to be looking at models that uh, engage mental health, uh, substance abuse providers and uh, clinicians when an overdose calls comes in on a 911 dispatch. And instead of sending a law enforcement individual, we're sending a social services individual or a co-responder right to that scene, getting help not only to the individual with Narcan, but also to the family and keeping and diverting the individual from entering the law enforcement community. Great, thank you so much. And we will be posting the slides 
both in the chat and we will post them online on the registration page for this event. So be on the lookout. And if you don't, you can reach out. If you don't see them online, you can reach out to us. There are a couple other questions that are coming in that I'm gonna hold a little bit for our next panel because I think they are very much related to that. We are going to transition now. It's 2.30 and we're gonna move on. We really appreciate Stephen Aquario, your leadership, both in New York, but nationally with all your state association peers. Thank you very much. And if you can stay on, we'll, we'll have more questions throughout the process. We're gonna to move to our next panel that is gonna talk more about the state association and the individual county strategies and the lessons learned more on the intrastate allocation models. And that does include some of the eligible use of funds on these agreements. As was mentioned earlier, we're, we're somewhat in the middle of this process. Some of the attorneys generals and the state associations or individual counties have struck kind of preliminary MOUs, if you will, and we're still waiting for the national settlement details. But there are some early lessons learned about how individual counties and those working statewide kind of got together, including with some of their municipalities, developed a strategy to engage with their state leaders, mostly the attorneys generals, some cases the legislatures and the governors, and have really worked. So we're honored today to be joined by representatives from three different states with three different very three different models. We're going to have Tom Liddy, who is with the civil division in one of the councils for Maricopa County, Arizona. He is really thrilled to take a couple of hours off to not work on election lawsuits. And so this is this is fun time for him to get away from the election feuds. We're going to hear from Kevin Leonard, who's the executive director of the North Carolina County Commissioners Association, and some of his colleagues from the North Carolina Department of Justice will also join us, and Kevin will introduce them in a second. And Kylie Bur Burris from the Legislative Policy Advocate with the Colorado Counties, Inc., which is the State Association of California Counties. With the interest of time, we're going to dig right in. I'm going to start with Tom Liddy, who was in the courtroom this morning, and now he's pleased to join us. Tom, can you give us a little overview of Arizona? You've, you've moved ahead with kind of an MOU with the state where it looks like the state would get 44% of the money and locals would get 56%, certainly different than the default. Can you walk us through the process that you led in Arizona with your colleagues? I certainly can and thank you for the invitation. I wanna thank Steve for that brilliant overview that covers a lot of the um, information that we had to have to discuss with our attorney general and with the other counties in Arizona. Each state obviously is unique. Ours is different in that uh, my county, our county, has a population that that uh, consists of 64 to 65% of the total of the entire state. The, um, the opioid fan have put forth a proposal in which they're going to a lot more money in settlement. The state combined with at least 50% or the counties that, that, can, that include 50% of the population will agree to it. So you know, we were the 800 pound gorilla and that we had far more than 50% of the population in just one county. However, a key component to our success is that we didn't log that over the other counties. We treated every single county as an equal partner. And just as Steve from New York said, uh, you've got to hang together, you're going to hang separately. The state attorney general felt very strongly that it should be the attorney general and the attorney general only should go to court on this issue. But going back to the tobacco settlement days, where Arizona's fund for the tobacco settlement all went to the state and the legislature got to direct a significant portion of it. And let me just say some of it went to fix potholes uh, and not for abatement of harm caused to Arizonans by tobacco. And the counties were adamant that that was not going to happen. Interestingly enough, the opioid litigation defendants are adamant that all of the funds recovered will only be used for opioid abatement. So ironically, we have an ally in the opioid defendants in negotiation with Arizona Attorney General 
saying we the counties want to participate. Long story short, everything Steve said applied here. We are we filed our lawsuit in 2018. We are part of the MDL that's um, before Judge Polster in Ohio. But we look very closely at what's been happening in Cuyahoga County, Ohio, and very closely to what's been happening in West Virginia, and very closely to what's been happening in New York in order to inform us in what was possible. Now, our stake is, our state is so large. New York State, because they have one city, New York City, that has uh, two counties in it, and they're very large. New York City, we were very interested to see how um, New York State handled that. And we did something uh, similar. And I, I can't get into the final details, but we took the MDL, uh, I'm sorry, the default formula of 15-15-70. That's 15% goes to the state, 15% to the counties to divide up the south, 15 counties here in Arizona. And the remaining 7% went in the abatement fund. We ripped it out of hand. And primarily because you have to look at the fine language of how that abatement fund is administered. And it wouldn't necessarily have been a problem for my county. We're a robust county with Phoenix in it and uh, Mesa and Scottsdale and Glendale and a lot of other counties that are, a lot of other municipalities that are very sophisticated, have their own public health um, infrastructures. Uh, but a lot of the out counties, of the bureaucracy and the reporting requirements that would be required to even apply to get funds out of that abatement fund. So we uh, negotiated, I was going to say argue, but we negotiated with the attorney general after getting all 15 counties together, singing off the same sheet of music, which don't take for granted. It takes some work, a lot of good give and take said the road with public health in Maricopa County by Maricopa County Public Health Department serving uh, people that are harmed by opioids and other afflictions. Some of the smaller counties, not so. And so we want to move on the negotiation. And we were really a 30-30 model. We heard from the Attorney General that there was no way the state would ever agree to the county uh, to the counties combined getting more than the state, and the state wasn't bluffing, and I didn't want to waste time arguing it. Some other counties did. We had to negotiate together, and we agreed to be the same. So it would be thirty percent state counties, and then the remainder. 40% in the uh, abatement fund. But as we continued on that adjusted, at the end of the day, uh, counties are gonna have more access to any settlement funds than, than will the state. And it was all done in, in good faith negotiations, watching what's happening, arguing, and believe it or not, this uh, pandemic, we're all, we all find ourselves in the midst, is a model to see how the state reacts with reporting, contract tracing, and the administration of vaccine different counties, different cities, and different um, the smaller counties. So it was a stark relief Tom. of who actually does what, in what part of the state. And that it can be a model. To, hey, Tom. Yes. Could you shut off your camera? We're having a hard time with your audio. Is there a question? And maybe. Well, if, if you maybe shut off your camera, we're, we're having a real hard time hearing you okay. with your, your sound but maybe it'll help with your bandwidth if you shut off your camera and just talk and see if that'll work. Okay. My see if that helps. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, I, I think I've shut off my Here. camera. Is that successful? Yep. Can you hear me better? That sounds a lot better. Okay, so I, thank you. I did put together some lessons learned and I'll run through them um, with you. Number one, our unifying theme, whenever we spoke with other counties or with municipalities or with the attorney general was, we're not all gonna get what we want, but at the end of the day, please bear in mind that every dollar that comes in in settlement funds will be used to help an individual in Arizona who has been harmed directly or indirectly from opioids. And we kind of had to remind each other that if more funds go through the state public health than the county, it's okay. That's gonna be used to help people that have been harmed. If 
money goes through the abatement fund and eventually goes to help as long as it's helping somebody. And that was the unifying factor that we always kept in mind. Another, you know, we had some real differences with the attorney general with regard to opioids, but we kept the relationship professional and respectful. And that, that paid off big dividends in the end. When our attorney general compromised with all of our counties standing together, we made sure that we publicly praised the attorney general in the state for, for their leadership. It takes leadership to compromise rather than gloat over. We never, ever did that in public. Um, we always treated the attorney general as a teammate. There were a lot of hurt feelings between the counties and the attorney general. Attorney general went to court and uh, before Judge Polster and tried to have our lawsuits thrown out and failed. We didn't laud that over them. We just said, hey, we're all Arizonans. We're all together. We're all going to work together. You're the attorney general. You're the leader. In private, we had some tough negotiations, but never, ever did anything that would embarrass the attorney general uh, in public. Now, with our relationships with the other counties, different sizes, doesn't matter. Treat everybody equally. We have some counties that have filed lawsuits, some in state court, some a part of the MDL. Others aren't plaintiffs at all. We were sure in our model that we treated every county the same. Didn't matter if you were plaintiff or not. Now, it does matter in terms of a portion of the settlement funds that will go to pay attorneys. But for the funds that are going to come into Arizona, they're going to help people who are suffering, who have lost parents or people that are suffering from addiction. It doesn't matter whether your county is a plaintiff or not. Everyone's going to share in the proceeds. Um, our goal from day one was to ensure that all counties spoke with one voice, just as New York did. Very, very important. You don't want to allow the attorney general or the defendants to divide and conquer counties. Um, and so we we made some tough compromises to make sure that we all stayed together on that. And that's an important part. We have two very large counties, uh, Maricopa Mine, uh, Pima County down um, in Tucson. And we worked together to provide leadership to ensure that the other counties that were smaller did not ever feel like they were being bullied about by the larger counties. That was important. We created a clearinghouse for all questions. If uh, we had some sophisticated counties that were part of the MDL or part of their own lawsuits that knew a lot about McKesson, a lot about Johnson & Johnson, a lot about Purdue bankruptcy, and we had others that knew nothing about it. We created a clearinghouse that all questions uh, would be heard by everyone, put up on the internet, and then we would write answers. We'd go find the answers from outside counsel on our own, and we provided the answers. So everybody from every, from every county got all the questions and all the answers. That was uh, helpful as well. And we did use outside counsel considerably. We used Keller Warbach. Um, others had other outside counsel. And we watched what was happening in Ohio um, and West Virginia and New York closely in order to guide us. Um, the other thing to remember is that what the defendants, the, the distributors and the manufacturers have said is they don't want to do piecemeal settlements, not with individual counties. They want to hit it one state at a time. And they've sweetened the deal. There's 40% more in their initial settlement offer if the state and enough counties to equal 50% will all agree. And that was what we sold every county. It's a much bigger pie. And you may not get the exact piece of the pie that you want, but we're all gonna do better if we get a bigger pie. And that was very helpful. Um, and, and so that was another driving factor that we had. Um, so that those are my lessons learned. Um, it's been a long road since 2018 and uh, I'll take questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Great, and, and Tom, just real quick, cause we did lose your audio there for a second. Could you restate what the final percentages were in your MOU real quick? Well, so the the default um, the default distribution share would be the state gets 15%, the cities and the counties get 15%, and the abatement bucket gets 70%. We rejected that outright. Um, the state was clear to us that they would never agree to the counties getting more than the state, the combined counties. So we worked on a 50-50, the rescue and the abatement fund. We fought very long and very hard to shrink the abatement fund 
because of the bureaucracy that was uh, related to applying to the abatement fund in order to get funds into the counties and we succeeded. So our uh, counter, we looked at the Ohio model, which was 15 state bucket, 30% for the counties, 55 for the abatement fund. And we rejected that. We put forth 30, 30 and 40. So 30% for the state, 30% to the counties. That was a hard sell for the counties, but I sold it this way. Um, that's 50-50 with the state and the 40 of the abatement fund. Now the final number, I can't share with you at this time, but we will be able to in the near future, the abatement fund is smaller than 40, but at the end of the day, the settlement funds, if and when this all works out, will be at about 58% available to the states, uh, of, I'm sorry, to the counties and 43% for the state. Um, that's, that's where we came into an agreement and that's where we're together. And that's what we're gonna present to the opioid uh, manufacturer and opioid distributors um, to, that's our memorandum of understanding that's gonna shape what our settlement's gonna be if we're successful. Perfect. That sounds like a great model for us to use nationally. So great work. And we really appreciate that. We're gonna come back for Q and A. I'm gonna move on to, to Kevin Leonard, the executive director of the North Carolina County Commissioners Association. And Kevin has to be a little bit more delicate. He's in the middle of negotiations, but he can talk about some preliminary lessons learned. And so Kevin, thank you again for your leadership. And it's great to have two of your colleagues from the North Carolina Department of Justice joining you, particularly for Q&A. So Kevin, go ahead. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, making sure you can hear me. And just because I love to live life on the edge, I'm going to uh, share my screen myself. So here we go, hoping for no cat videos or anything like that. So. Can you see the screen? All right. Yes. Except it looks like this is pulling over here. Get that off there. Okay, great. Which which screen are you seeing, by the way? Your home, your main slide. Okay, very good. So, President Moore, thank you, thank you so much, and Matt, we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share our experience in North Carolina with uh, fellow colleagues across the country today. And um, make sure I got this, we'll go to the next slide. Let me, let me start here. Um, I wanted to put some faces and names together of, of folks I'm gonna be referencing in, uh, in the presentation and, and the dialogue. As, as Matt said, we, I'm gonna focus more on process in terms of what the association has been involved in in North Carolina. Um, let me state this, that our, our experience in North Carolina is our experience in North Carolina. Just as we say, if you've been to one county, you've been to one county. If you've been to one state, you've been to one state. Everybody is playing with different variables, different actors in terms of who you're negotiating with, whether it's your AG, as Matt said, your governor, or even the legislature. Um, so things are very particular in different states. This is our experience, and I'm hopeful that if we're able to relay information that's helpful to you in, in your state, um, that, that that's, uh, that's good. And we're happy to talk about this further offline if we need to get into more detail. Um, credit where credit is due. I want to recognize the folks on the screen here, primarily at, uh, from the start, our membership and our leadership on our board. So you'll see here past president, Kevin Austin. Um, he was the president of our organization when uh, really this some of the, the, the bigger pieces were put in place. He appointed a committee that you'll hear me talk about in a, in a few moments. That committee, uh, the negotiating committee made up of our membership uh, has our current president, President Ronnie Smith on that committee. And without their support and our board's support of the association being involved in this, I don't think we would have that greater role um, in North Carolina that the association is, is playing. And I'll get into that in a second. But also a couple of my colleagues, um, our Deputy Director General Counsel, Amy Basin, and our Associate General Counsel, Paige, Paige Warsham, have spent countless hours since the beginning of this, which dates back to four years for us, have uh, really been leaders on this. And you'll hear me talk about them in a second. So the best way that I could think of when Matt uh, reached out to discuss um, you know, our experience in North Carolina to tell our story in terms of process and the involvement of the association of, of county commissioners in North Carolina is to really walk you through a timeline and, and sort of paint you a picture of how the association here has been engaged and involved 
uh, given all of the background now that you've heard from Steve and Tom uh, and President, President Moore. So we're, this for us really dates back to so, uh, summer, spring of 2017, when uh, counties in North Carolina across the nation really started hearing more about uh, litigation with um, against the distributors and manufacturers and whether or not they were considering whether to engage in, in lawsuits. Um, so that really transitioned for us. It really culminated in the November timeframe, sort of the fall, when it became incumbent upon us and really re we realized that we need to draw all the, the, uh, the different groups together. So the association played a role in pulling the national councils in uh, the local councils in North Carolina, the county attorneys and our state uh, Department of Justice, the AG's office to basically brief the counties, the county, and we have 100 counties in North Carolina, brief them about the level, uh, level, the, the, uh, the, a level set on what's going on so they could have information to take to their boards as to whether or not they were going to engage in a lawsuit or not. So, so then after that meeting, going into 18 in 2018, largely that year, the, the counties were starting to decide whether or not they were going to take lawsuit. And so we ended up having 76 counties in North Carolina. There, again, there's 176 uh, engaged in the lawsuit. Um, and so during that period of time, 18, 19, we were keeping our members updated through our various affiliate organizations. Amy and Paige were working with the county attorneys, with our county managers, and of course our board, keeping them updated about what was happening. This is when Steve was talking about the MDL happened in Ohio, and we were just basically keeping them apprised of all of, all of that type of information. But it wasn't until uh, September of 19, and why this date is really important is because um, the AG's office reached out to Amy and myself, Steve Mange, who's on the, uh, the, uh, the call today, and I'll introduce he and Swain Wood in, in a moment, reached out to us to have in earnest conversations about what a state agreement would look like between the AG's, uh, the, the state AG's office and the counties. We being recognized as the entity in North Carolina representing all 100 counties, the place uh, to go to, and we were very, grateful for uh, Steve reaching out and the state AG's team reaching out to us. That turned into monthly meetings with that team, with the state AG's team. And uh, to be quite candid, it was, um, it was revealing to us, and I think to the AG's team too, about how much um, we had to educate one another on the roles and responsibilities of the county governments in North Carolina. In North Carolina, uh, the human services are really delivered and, uh, at the county level within the county government. So we literally are on the front lines of this opioid crisis and then educating just how county governments work. So there was a, a great amount of education between the, the state AG's team and us just about how we, we operate. Then in January of 2020, which seems like ages ago now, um, we we called together another meeting of our membership because they were seeking a unified voice about where we were with this litigation. So we, the association, held basically an emergency special meeting, calling all those same actors again in the national councils, the AG's team, the local councils. We invited the board chair, the county manager, and the county attorney, and we were all in person then. And we basically got a level set again about where the litigation was, but out of that meeting, and this is sort of a turning point for us in North Carolina, our own members ask us to form a special committee that would be the negotiating committee on behalf of the counties with the state AG in terms of our agreement. So that committee was appointed by President Austin, who I mentioned earlier, and we call it the 555 committee in North Carolina. It will become self-evident in a moment why it's called that, but that committee started meeting uh, in March of last year. Funny aside, we at, before COVID, we were like, hey, let's use this new technology called Zoom. We've never heard of it before. Turns out that's all we've used now, of course. And a uh, takeaway is that that's actually helped in this effort because it's a lot easier to bring those groups together uh, you know, in, in Zoom world than it was. So it's provided even more conversation. So that 555 committee started meeting in March and it's been meeting monthly. Uh, since uh, March of last year, so uh, over almost a year now. 
and uh, and those have been very productive conversations. Let me tell you about the 555 committee. Um, let me first start by saying that it is quite an honor to work with this group of folks. It became evident to us that it wasn't just the county attorneys that needed to be seated at the table in the negotiation because the county attorneys obviously need to be there from a, a litigation standpoint, but the county manager needs to be there to think about the programmatic pieces and the county budget and how it fits in. And then of course the county commissioners, the policymakers, and finally the decision maker need to understand the high level of what was going on. So five county commissioners, five county managers, and five county attorneys make up this association special committee. And why it's an honor to work with them, these are passionate people who are interested in this subject matter. Several of them have very close um, relationships and stories to tell about their experiences with, with opioids. And so these are some emotional meetings when we get together and they bring a different level of context when we're talking about these things. They told us as representative of our counties that, that they're very interested in making sure that the money, as somebody said earlier, goes to fixing this problem. And what a transformational opportunity this is. We don't want to miss it, right? This is sort of a one-time one -time deal. As somebody also mentioned, in North Carolina, a lot of history with the tobacco settlement. So we knew going in, and our members told us that they wanted monies really going directly to counties so it could get the most effective use of those dollars as much as we could and to try to steer away as much as we could from a bureaucratic uh, abatement type of fund. So um, that, that is our 555 committee, and I just um, am very proud to work with, with that group of people. And furthermore, I'm very proud to, to, to draw your attention to these two gentlemen who are on the call today, and I'm very proud to work with them because over the past year, it's taken a lot of time, a lot of conversations, meeting monthly, Swain Wood is the first assistant attorney general and general counsel for Josh Stein, who is our, our attorney general in North Carolina, and Steve Mange, senior policy and strategy counsel um, for the state AGs uh, in North Carolina. They've been tremendous partners with this, and we've come a long way since the beginning of our conversation. So they're on the line today. They're, they, they said they didn't care to speak, but they're here to answer any questions. So that's our experience in North Carolina, and we appreciate the opportunity to share it. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. For those that do have questions, please, again, use the chat function, and we'll, we'll get to those. We have one more speaker. Kylie Burris is, is a legislative policy advocate for the Colorado Counties State Association. And she's going to represent the state of Colorado today, at least from a county perspective. Kylie, why don't you go ahead and thank you again. Hi, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Just a thumbs up would work. Great. Awesome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Matt, did you give me that capability? Okay. All right, well, Matt, thank you for the introduction. My name is Kylie Briss and I'm a legislative and policy advocate with Colorado Counties Incorporated. I wanna take a moment to thank Matt Chase and Judge Moore and NACO for inviting us today. Really appreciate the opportunity to engage with you. So Colorado Counties or CCI represents 61 of the 64 counties in Colorado. And we were brought back into the settlement back in July when um, our outside counsel were deadlocked in negotiations with the attorney general. And they had reached out to us to get the conversation moving again. When we realized that we were going to be engaging in the negotiations with the attorney general, Phil Weiser of Colorado, we realized we needed to do some internal work with our own cities and counties to make sure that we could provide a unified voice in, in these negotiations. That process alone took about three months in which during this time, the attorney general was meeting individually with cities and counties to advocate for his proposal. And this was by far a huge challenge in trying to create a unified voice. But how did we accomplish uh, a unified voice? Well, we accomplished it with the following. First, we let counties choose which regions they wanted to be in or even if they wanted to be in a region. They know whom they work best with. Second, an issue that came up early on was the rural versus urban divide. Since we were following the national formula, urban areas would be getting a bigger portion of the settlement than rural areas. So to address this, we advocated for, advocated for a 10% set aside of the allocation to address infrastructure needs that rural areas could then tap into. 
Third, if we had an internal disagreement, we never fought about it in front of the attorney general. This was accomplished through long, long weekly meetings, lots of conversations, and many rough drafts of our proposals. When it was time to engage with the AG's office, uh, these were our three collective goals. And first, in making sure we had a unified voice, we created a group of 30 to 40 eager local elected officials and local government counterparts that we would refer to as our working group. This is a group that helped establish the proposal that then our negotiation group, which is of 10 to 12 people, would bring to the AG. So we have two groups here, 30 to 40 folks, um, which was made up of city uh, council members, mayors, city attorneys, county commissioners, so it was all local government. So this is how we provided uh, a unified voice. Our second um, collective goal is we all agreed that we wanted to receive the full benefit of the settlement and that securing the full amount, which for Colorado is about $438 million, was of the utmost importance. Our third was getting the funding to the places where it is needed most. In creating a regional governance and model that received a direct distribution, we would be able to make sure that the dollars would get where they needed to go and that would, there would be protections in place to make sure that the governor and the legislature could not tap into these funds. This is something that happened uh, during the tobacco settlement in Colorado, so we wanted to make sure that this wouldn't happen again. In our first negotiation conversation with the Attorney General, which happened in December, again, July is when we were first brought in, three months of organizing, and then we were uh, diving into negotiations. Our first negotiation meeting with the AG was in December, and it was about the regional makeup. To this date, this was probably our most challenging conversation with the AG because we deferred so much with him on how the region should look. He thought there should be only eight to 10 regions, and we pushed back, stressing the need that counties choose which regions they are in because they, knew, they know whom they work with best. Our pushback ended up being successful, but it was a long process. And um, uh, our pushback ended up being successful. And what we like most about this proposal in front of you and our draft map, again, the negotiations are ongoing, so nothing is final, but this is our potential potentially final map. Um, what we really like about this is it's organic and it was homegrown and our counties talked with each other to establish these relationships that then they would carry on into these opioid abatements. Um, as for uh, governance structure for these regions, each region will have a regional board as their oversight. Some of these pieces are still being finalized, so I can't go into too much detail with you right now. But one thing I'll note is that each board will have the flexibility to create an oversight committee that works best for them. All right, so the next biggest issue, of course, is the allocation. How is this going to work? The AG's proposed model on the left is what we started off with. And the model on the right is, the agree is our agreement moving, moving forward. As you can see, the Attorney General really wanted to see 15% directly to the state, 15% directly to cities and counties, and the remainder 70% directly into a state abatement fund. After very tough negotiations and expressing the need for local control around these funds, we ended up with the, the um, percentages on the right. So 20% direct allocation to, uh, to our cities and counties, 60% di direct allocation to our regions, 10% for infrastructure, again, to address that rural urban need and the 10% direct allocation to the state. Um, as I mentioned earlier, again, and the, the, just something I'd like to highlight is we, we did, we found a lot of challenges with the rural and urban divide, but we found that highlighting 10% for infrastructure that then folks could tap into for additional medication or facilities really helped get the conversation back on track. Um, so that, that's, those are our key takeaways from the settlement. And I wanna let you know that a lot of time and energy did go into um, this proposal and that um, I do wanna thank the attorney general and highlight his willingness to work with us that once we established our goals and had our unified voice, he really worked alongside us and not against us. Additionally, those are our lessons learned, but I wanna leave you with three major takeaways from this very long process and it, it, it's not quite finished yet. Um, but if you can get all your local government folks on board and speak with a unified, unified voice early on. Second, have the difficult conversations needed to make sure all concerns are addressed. That's how we found a solution with the rural and urban issue. And third, understand that working on this is a marathon, not a race. 
roll with the punches and understand setbacks are going to happen. Thank you again for your time and I'm open to discuss any questions or further thoughts. Great, Kylie, thank you so much. I'll, I'll send you the first question. There's a little, folks want a little bit more depth on how the county selected their regions. You mentioned some of it was just the working relationship and maybe the personalities, or in your case, it might be they, the counties look close on a map, but there might be mountains in between the counties and, and maybe they really don't connect as much as people think. But was it population driven? Were these natural regions? Can you just give us 30 seconds on that? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I am happy to say that I have some of our county commissioners and our executive director on the call today. So if there are um, pieces that I'm missing, guys, please jump in and fill in. But, you know, there's a lot of a lot of these regions were established. We have a lot of um, behavioral health maps out there for our mental health facilities or our um, use disorder facilities or where our Department of Human Services are located in counties and where those natural um, uh, natural working partnerships are already established. And so there was a lot of, we also have a map for CCI of how we break up our own counties. And really it's just how counties already work together or have established those relationships. And that's how we've we've formed that map. And, and that's in part why we wanted it to be or, or, no, or no, an organic project because we wanted those counties who know whom they work best with, especially in those areas where there are mental health providers or behavioral health providers um, that they already have established those relationships. John, right. I, I see you on the call. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you covered it. I, I think, think the other thing that we tried to do as um, Matt Chase mentioned is, there were there are mountain boundaries between certain uh, counties that 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 uh, that make it really difficult for traveling for treatment from one county to another, and so we they, we took that into consideration as well. But these are already established relationships that these counties have with each other, like North Carolina. We manage um, you know um, health and human services on behalf of the state in Colorado. So we have these kind of districts and relations that's already built. And the first attorney general map was based on just cutting up into what he called economies of scale that didn't really match the geography or the current relationships of counties that work together on other programs we administer for the federal government and the state. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna to go to Tom Liddy. Tom, in Arizona, you have 15 counties in a, in a state. And as you mentioned, Maricopa County has a disproportionate population. But also, you had to deal with two, two issues. You mentioned those counties that actually signed on to different lawsuits and those that didn't. And if you can talk about how you treated them. But you also have cities and towns that are part of the local partnership, if you will. Can you talk about one? You already mentioned a little bit, but go back and talk about how you're treating those two different types of counties, those that sued and those that didn't, and how are the counties working with the towns and the cities within the county boundaries? Thank you, Matt. Those are two great questions. The first one is easy to answer. Um, my county attorney, Alistair Adell, and I agreed that all counties should be treated equally. Uh, whether they are plaintiffs or not, all counties, regardless of side, were treated allocation formulas different based um, not so much on population, but based on harm due to opioids. So that was easy. But we are very unique in that the different size city, we have a city, Phoenix, which is, and we have another uh, town, uh, Guadalupe, that was founded. It's in the major metropolitan area, but it was founded by. Native Americans from the border who came up generations ago just to seek jobs. And they have very little infrastructure, very little tax base, no police force. And they are also suffering from uh, the problems brought on by opioid addiction. And under the formula, uh, Guadalupe is so small, they're a rounding error. They get zero. So we listened to every single city and every single town and, and gave them a sounding board and listened to their unique circumstances. They made sure that they weren't forgotten, 
that they're getting some funding um, at the end of the day uh, in, in the instance of Guadalupe from Maricopa County share in different counties had different issues. Um, Coconino County up in flag where Flagstaff is not a small county, but their health care uh, system is pressured by the Navajo reservation. Navajo reservations in four different states and they have their own opioid litigations going on. So that was very unique. Other, you know, Navajo County, Apache County also have those situations. So every single issue was on the table. We made sure that everyone listened and we uh, no detail was too small. Um, so basically you treat everybody with respect and you give everyone a, a sounding board and then you try to help them uh, with their issues. Uh, and, you know, and that's how we did it. And it, it, it's just like uh, Kylie said, it's a marathon. It's an absolute marathon. Um, and our smaller counties did combine into regions because otherwise they would have, you know, no ability to do this. Um, so that's, that's how we did it. I hope that answers your question. So that is great. Kevin Leonard, anything else that you would like to add to that? Well, how you're working with your municipalities? Matt, if I may, John. Oh, absolutely. In, Go ahead. Because I think this is for Kevin and his team, but maybe also for Tom and others. One of the things I think we need to bring out here is how important counties are to be able to maximize 100% for your state. Uh, if the counties, we, we hold some very powerful cards in this negotiation. For instance, I think here in Kentucky, if the counties don't work with our AG, the AG will settle for about 46% of what the state might be able to get. And I think that's true across the board, and maybe that's because of how many counties have filed suit. So we have great value to our AGs and to our states to work together and, and vice versa to be able to maximize these dollars for our citizens. So who would like to take that one? And for the counties that aren't as involved in settlement discussions, you might not be aware of this yet. So I think we really need to bring this forward. I can jump in and take a stab at that, um, President Moore. I, I agree with the statement that you made, you know, from North Carolina's perspective, perspective and it's easy. I love the fact that we have 100 counties, it's a nice even number. Um, but it, early on in our conversations with the state AG's team is that that was just a foregone conclusion that we would be working for 100 counties. And that's just in the culture of our organization, whether they were in lawsuit or not, um, that that was important to the AG's team. It's important to us and our membership. Um, there were conversations about how the maybe the 76 would be treated differently, um, but quickly we were able to resolve those questions. And you're right, there is, as Kylie said, a unified voice brings a lot of bargaining power to the table. And so, so I would encourage that uh, to the extent that you, you can certainly do that. Matt, you had asked about, um, I don't know if that fully uh, addressed your question, President Moore, but um, to, to the point that Matt was making on our work with municipalities in North Carolina, because of our distinction of delivering human services in North Carolina, the cities don't have those responsibilities in North Carolina to that significant, significant degree. So we've only got, I think, maybe seven cities in the state of North Carolina that have taken suit uh, in, in this. So it's largely a, uh, a county issue. Um, However, the national litigation does take into account the municipal uh, 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 impacts. And so that is being wrapped into our discussions. Uh, and that's how we're working through that. Yeah. Would others like to weigh in on that question of the importance of the counties in these uh, settlements? Yeah, um, Judge Moore and, and Matt and uh, other folks on the panel, if that's okay, I'd like to, to put in the two cents from, from Colorado's perspective. As I mentioned in my presentation early on, it was really important for us to join and have a unified voice. Um, I'm not going to lie, it took a little bit of pushing to get the cities at the table, but when we did, um, we realized that if there were things that we needed to work out as local government cities and counties, we had those conversations separately and not in front of the attorney general so weak spots couldn't be found. Um, and 
these negotiations are still ongoing. So of course, we're still ironing out the kinks. Um, but I do want to say that it was so instrumental in our county involvement. And I just want to give a shout out to our county commissioners because they've been phenomenal in this entire process. They've been very hands on, very engaging. I mean, this is very important work to them and they're proud to be doing it for their communities. So, you know, our, our counties are, are our backbone and we're, we're lucky to be working for them on, the, on this very important work. Does that answer your question, Judge? Yes, thank you. Great. Tom, do, do, any, any other closing comments from this panel? Uh, Judge Moore, I, I did want to add, and, and to Kylie and Kevin and the, and the great presentations that they've made, that the role of the counties is critical. We cannot get this done without the county direct engagement, whether they litigated or not. They are part of the solution of bringing services to those most in need. We are seeing spikes again with fentanyl derivatives through the pandemic. We're seeing spikes of overdose, overdose deaths again returning to our state. Now more than ever, we have got to get a handle on how to abate this problem. The counties working with their state attorneys general is absolutely critical. The state cannot settle these lawsuits with the distributors because they simply won't settle them without the counties being engaged. Regional approaches, there is no one size fits all approach. New York, a very complex structured settlement here. Very complex, big city, big counties, mostly rural and suburban counties. We have a long way to go and a short time to get there to get this settlement done, but the direct engagement of the counties and our outside counsel in particular, very important to get this done. So the timing of this presentation was just absolutely critical and very appreciative. Thank you, Judge Moore. Great. Thank Tom, Judge, do you have any if questions? I could, absolutely, go ahead. I, I do, I, I wanna mention one thing. A lot of the public cost of opioid abuse, whether it be in, uh, drug addiction treatment, behavioral health programs. Um, a lot of it is law enforcement related. Um, a lot of times when people that are addicted to opioids, if they are found collapsed on the street, it's the police and it's uh, the, the county emergency personnel that arrive. Um, if it's somebody who's, dr who's driven to come out or feed uh, a habit, it's the police. Uh, when addicts are in jail, it's correctional health that pays the price. If part of the answer is deferred prosecution, all of that's county, 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 county. And that is an argument that we made with the um, attorney general counties that had a lot of sway. Uh, the cost is not just directly related to opioids, but the other behavioral issues, health and law enforcement, and all um paid for by the counties. Great, so agree. And, and, and you did see with New York, North Carolina and Colorado, those three states in Ohio, you're gonna hear as we transition to the next panel, they are three of the 10 states where counties run the human services. The bulk of the federal human service programs are actually run at the county level. And so you see that. Two quick stories as we wrap up and thank our panelists. Uh, Monday, one of the, my NACO staff colleagues actually fell and broke her arm. And she was telling me yesterday that she, her doctor gave her 30 days of opiates with Oxycontin when she was going to see her doctor in three days. One, she wasn't going to take it anyways. But her question to me was, why is my doctor still giving me 30 days worth, the, worth of Oxycontin when I'm going to see a physician in three days for a follow-up? You know, why aren't they giving me three days? So we still have a long way to go with behavior. The other thing I wanna wrap up is, as Congress is dealing with the next COVID aid package, one of the provisions that NACO has pushed and that is included in the House plan right now would deal with the Medicaid jail inmate exclusion, which is the current federal policy that inmates lose their federal benefits at arrest, not post adjudication. The House bill that is moving this week and into next would actually allow counties to start billing Medicaid for those individuals in their jails that are eligible 30 days prior to release. And that is something we've been pushing for a long time. 
and that would apply to both prisons and jails. So in this case, pre-adjudication and post-adjudication so that you could start billing Medicaid for treatment services 30 days prior to release. Now we're gonna transition back to Judge Moore into a great panel with some in Cuyahoga counties in Ohio who've been really at the forefront of this whole lawsuit and already have some settlements. And I'll let Judge Moore introduce our distinguished panelists. Judge Moore. Well, thank you, Matt. And thanks to everyone that's been a part of this uh, session so far. Uh, I think you find it uh, quite exciting. So we have heard a lot about the Ohio settlements and two counties that are at the forefront of this are Cuyahoga and Summit County. And it's a pleasure that we have their county executives with us today. Uh, we wanna hear from them about everything from governance to how they're working with their jurisdictions on revenue, uh, but more about how they're using the funds uh, which are already flowing or, or we'll hear how that's working. And I think some differences as to whether we're looking at capital expenditures or programming and what those very varying uh, concepts might look like. So first, let me introduce uh, a friend, someone that I've been in many sessions with, County Executive Armin Budish. Uh, he's the Chief Executive of Cuyahoga County. He has a diverse career. Now listen to this. He has served as the Speaker of the House in Ohio. Uh, 24 years as a newspaper columnist and a television program host. He founded a law firm. He's nationally recognized in his work in elder law, and he's written several books on the topic. Armin, it's great to see you here. I wish we were in person and uh, welcome to you. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Eileen as well, uh, and then we'll uh, move into the panel. Uh, the other county executive from Summit County, uh, Ohio, is County Executive Eileen Shapiro. She became the fifth Summit County Executive in August of 2016. As executive, she oversees nine county departments and a budget of nearly half a billion dollars per year. Uh, previously, she served as the count on the county council for nearly 10 years. She has a proven uh, record and great skills in leading Summit County through the COVID pandemic, but also in developing a street strategic plan for the topic that we're discussing today. And then they have some other people from their teams, uh, Brian Nelson, Greta Johnson, that may be joining into the panel. Uh, but let's start off with you, County Executive Budish, for your opening comments and any thoughts you might have on the topic thus far. Thank you, Judge. Appreciate it. And uh, it is great to see you again. I wish we were in person like we've been in the past, but we'll have to make do. Thank you. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Matt Chase and NACO. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed my work with Matt and uh, NACO, uh, especially in the last year with the, uh, with the pandemic. Uh, I can't say how, how much I appreciate the work that was done um, uh, to try to uh, loosen the standards a little bit for the use of the COVID dollars. Uh, and uh, it has made all the difference in the world. It basically saved us in Cuyahoga County uh, uh, over the last year. And, and I really appreciate, uh, Matt, your work and, and NACO. So thank you. I also want to introduce, uh, I do have Brandy Carney on with me. She's our uh, she's our public safety uh, chief, and uh, uh, more importantly, she's our drug czar in the in the county. So she hates when I call her that, but she's in charge of our of our settlement dollars. So um, I'll start by saying that Ohio was extremely hard hit by the opioid crisis. We're still having hundreds of deaths by overdose every year. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's terrible. Uh, in October of 2017. We filed our lawsuit against the manufacturers and distributors and pharmacies that created this terrible problem. Um, we felt it was important to try to hold them accountable for the devastation that they've caused. Uh, our staff spent literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours working with the lawyers, compiling data and sitting for interviews and undergoing depositions. And uh, uh, you know, it was a huge commitment by the county uh, not so much in dollars, uh, although there was some, but it was a lot of time. Uh, but we, we thought it was important. Um, uh, cases nationally were consolidated before Judge Dan Polster. 
in the Northern District of Ohio. And the cases filed by Cuyahoga and Summit counties were designated as bellwether cases. Uh, we had a day, trial date set for October 21st of 2019, which uh, seems like forever ago now after the pandemic. But um, uh, after days, we, we, we literally had days and days of, of settlement discussions. Uh, they were generally fruitless. Um, uh, we, we had settlement discussions on uh, first on a global nature and those didn't work. And then we had settlement discussions uh, just for uh, our two counties. Um, and I have to say, I truly appreciated working closely with uh, Eileen uh, Shapiro, the um, uh, executive in Summit. Uh, you know, our being together, uh, I think, helped us both significantly in this settlement process. Um, uh, our trial date was set for October 21st of 2019, and uh, there was a lot of discussion and no settlement. Uh, so we ended the settlement discussions on Friday in the judge's courtroom. Uh, we all went home. Uh, trial was set for Monday. Uh, the lawyers, there were dozens of lawyers there, I mean, from all over the country. And, yep. uh, and I will say that on Sunday night at about midnight, I got a call from our lawyer saying that, uh, a settlement was reached at the number that I had uh, given him, and uh, and so we were able to to, uh, to to get this behind us. Cuyahoga County was awarded about 117 million dollars uh, as as its settlement share, and Summit County, I'm sure Eileen will tell you about theirs. Um, in Cuyahoga, we uh, determined how to spend the money by talking to all of our stakeholders locally. Uh, we determined to put the first tranche of money uh, to work immediately, uh, focusing on two primary goals. One was is treatment and the other education. We allocated $23 million for two years to um, a number of programs. And I'll just run through uh, quickly uh, what they were uh, or are. Uh, we uh, put money into our START unit, which is sobriety, treatment, and recovery intervention to families which um, are referred to our children and family services. As, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Judge, we do provide the um, uh, health and human services uh, uh, for the, for the, the county. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, families with chemical dependency needs uh, were uh, included in this first uh, amount of money. And we also provided funds uh, for board and care through our uh, health and Human Services, uh, Family and Children uh, uh, Services. Um, uh, about We figured about 17% of our costs for board and care are for uh, uh, children with uh, suffering from the effects of opiates. And so we took a portion of the funds to support them. Uh, then we gave a nice big chunk of money to the Adams Board uh, and they in turn use the funds for our, our Thrive ED program. Thrive is a peer recovery coaches program. It's a 24-7, 365 days a program where uh, coaches uh, literally are in emergency rooms of the major hospitals. We have three major hospitals in the county. Uh, and uh, uh, one of our hospitals first started this program and the others uh, we expanded to the other hospitals and supported all three hospitals with some of our uh, funds. What happens is that uh, the coaches uh, refer people after they are stabilized in the emergency room, refer them to places where they can get treatment one more longer term. Uh, some of the money went to Stellar Maris, which is uh, we expanded uh, additional residential treatment beds by 32, uh, uh, providing uh, medical and treatment care uh, Medic, uh, MAT and, and other uh, uh, needs uh, through this program. Uh, we provided money to St. Vincent Hospital, which is a fourth of our hospitals uh, uh, for inpatient and outpatient. They, they are the only uh, emergency room uh, hospital for devoted to uh, uh, addiction and mental health services. Um, we provided, we have a county hospital called Metro Hospital we provided funds there. Uh, they staff our county jail and uh, they added a significant programming uh, and treatment within the jail using some of the funds 
so that was, we thought, very helpful. Um, our um, Family and Children First Council received some funds. They provide education in K through 12 schools on drug abuse awareness. Uh, and we provided some funds to the medical examiner's office, uh, actually a significant amount for new equipment for drug testing and detection. And we provided some additional funds to our Court of Common Pleas. They already had, uh, I believe, three uh, specialty dockets uh, and they're adding a fourth for, uh, for um, addiction. Uh, so those were our primary uh, programs for the first $23 million. Uh, we worked with, and, and Brandy, who's on the line, worked with each of them, uh, each of the fund recipients to establish metrics to determine how successful each program is. Uh, and those that are the most impactful uh, may receive additional funds as we go forward, and those that are not will not. We also fit, focused on another major area uh, of our need here in the county. Um, as in many counties around the country, the jail has become the major provider of addiction and mental health services, which is not good policy. Uh, jails are not the best place to provide needed care uh, for mental health and addiction. Um, uh, people who commit serious violent crimes uh, must be locked up. We all recognize that, but many others would be much better served outside the criminal justice system. So we set out to create a diversion center, a center to divert people out of the criminal justice system who don't need to be there. Uh, people who have addiction and mental health uh, needs uh, and uh, uh, our diversion center will work with addiction and mental health service providers in the community. Uh, we'll be ready to open. We've been working on this diversion center. We'll be ready to open in the next two or three months. Uh, part of the program will be training for police officers throughout the county. Um, when they're on the street, they'll have the option to take a person to the diversion center rather than to jail, pre-booking. Um, we'll provide the officers with uh, training and we'll provide them with a 24-7 dedicated phone line staffed by addiction and mental health professionals. Uh, those professionals will be there to answer questions that they might have uh, while they're in real time on the streets. Uh, uh, the diversion center professionals then, once somebody comes in, will stabilize and treat people. Uh, they'll have beds uh, to keep them, uh, we're, we're figuring up to nine days. Um, uh, and then uh, they'll be referred once they're stabilized and they'll be referred to longer term facilities in the community. Some of which we're also supporting. Um, to create and operate the diversion center for the next five years, we're figuring it'll cost somewhere 50, 60 million dollars. Uh, that includes some capital, you were mentioning capital judge uh, and operational costs. So we're planning on using the funds for both. Uh, we'll also be using a portion of our settlement dollars to support uh, the longer term treatment programs that are in the community. As I said, we'll be referring people out. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's a lot, easy, it's a lot, uh, it's a lot easier to spend a hundred million dollars uh, than I ever would have thought. Uh, <laughs> after five years of treatment, we'll have helped a lot of people. Um, but here's the rub. Um, addiction will still be with us after five years. People will still be caught in the addiction cycle and people will still die. Uh, so while this uh, is still preliminary, um, uh, what I'm about to say is, is just an exploration, exploration right now, but we're exploring whether we can come up with fixes cures. Uh, we've been in Northeast Ohio, the epicenter of the opioid crisis. Now we're exploring whether we can become the epicenter of the opioid solution. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, and I can best explain through some examples. In conversations with experts at the Cleveland Clinic, they envision virtual reality goggles that can manage pain without drugs. In conversation with the Harrington Institute at university hospitals, they're working on several pain control medications which are not addictive. In a world of innovation, there are some exciting possibilities to take on and mitigate and possibly even conquer drug addiction. So we're working with the Cleveland Foundation and a national consultant to look at creating an opioid investment fund to select and invest in technologies that perhaps can solve the opioid crisis. We're just at the beginning, uh, 
And uh, if it appears fruitful, we will devote some of our settlement dollars for that. Uh, I'm hopeful that this may come to pass. If any of you on this program have any interest in the possibility of joining in such an investment vehicle as we move forward, uh, just let me know because we're certainly open to partners and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Wow, um, that was uh, quite impressive. Uh, and uh, before I open it up to questions, I wanna transition to our uh, colleagues in, uh, in Summit County. So County Executive Shapiro, uh, if you wanna give your comments and then we'll get into some discussion. Thank sure, you. thank you, President Moore, appreciate it. Um, and thanks for having us today. Uh, as uh, Executive Buttigieg mentioned, um, this was, um, uh, fast and furious from the time that um, declared, I declared a state of emergency in October of 17. And our uh, second and largest settlement was on uh, October of 19. So this was what extremely fast. I have a lot of folks to have to thank for that, um, including our teams. We work very collaborative. We are a community of collaborators here, bringing together as many people as we can. You heard um, Armin mentioned our collaboration with Cuyahoga County in doing this, and I certainly would be remiss if I didn't mention our health department and um, the uh, speed with which Judge, Pol Judge Polster made decisions and helped to move this forward. So um, we're going to go quickly through this. We took a, a different approach on this. This is um, one-time money. Can we flip this the screen? This is, maybe not. Um, this is one-time money. And so we looked at um, how we could take this and really systemically change how we deliver these kinds of services in Summit County. So we put together um, a key stakeholders group, which is myself, the uh, largest, the mayor of the largest city of, uh, in our county, which is Akron, uh, representative from our mayor's association, a representative from our township trustees association, and a representative, of course, from uh, public health. And so that was the key stakeholders, which are kind of think of those, and, and I'm going to shortcut this, just think of those as kind of governing principles and looking at where we're going and how we're going to get there, setting more of a strategic approach to uh, how we were going to deliver these services. So uh, from that, we created uh, the OAAC, we call it the Opiate Abatement Advisory Council. And this is a group of people that have expertise in addiction treatment and all the issues related to it. There's been a lot of talk about criminal justice. We know that they need to be a part of this conversation. We know that our first responders need to be a part of the conversation. We know the providers need to be a part of the conversation. And we certainly know that people with lived experience need to be a part of this conversation because we in a, in a small body of people cannot understand what everybody that's living through this every single day needs in order to change and improve their life and overcome this. So we put together this OAAC and the OAAC is charged with looking at um, four key areas and Greta's gonna talk a little bit more about those. But when we, looked at, when we look at this overall group of people these are people from our community that work in various ways to educate, to treat, to reduce harm. The list goes on and on and on. But these are the folks that make stuff happen every single day in our community. But we also look, look externally for best practices because we don't know what we don't know. We want to reach out to others to be able to do that. So how we deliver this, not only now, but in the future, is critically important. These problems are not going to go away. We're gonna make mid-course adjustments as we need to make them. We're gonna put money into the community to do some things in the short term, but we are also going to put some planning in place for the long-term viability so that we can stay contemporary with the needs of our community as we go forward over hopefully what will be decades. Having said that, I am going to now bounce that ball to, to Brian Nelson, my chief of staff, who's um, also our money guy. <laughs> Brian? <laughs> Thank you, Executive. Um, and Matt, I, I wish I had thought about this before we, uh, when we finalized these slides. Um, if we can move to the next slide, I'm gonna talk about what all of this means um, in terms of financials. The next one. Uh, but yeah, the next one. And 
I think I can really crystallize for everybody when we talk about 15%, what it is 15% actually gets you. So this is, the, this is a summary of the settlements reached between Summit and Cuyahoga County. In total, those settlements were $327.6 million. Summit County's share of that was just under $125.3 million. Now, we've heard from the, from the very time we settled, wow, $125 million. As Executive Budish said, it's really easy to spend $100 million when you start looking at the expanse of these problems. Now, that $125 million right off the top starts getting kind of whittled away when you talk about cash. Uh, so that $125 million was made up of $110 million in cash settlements, $12,160,000 in product settlements. And Greta in a minute is going to talk about the difficulties that I don't think any of us anticipated when somebody hands you $12 million worth of uh, controlled substances, and you have no distribution method or licensing or, or plan to distribute them, uh, which caused us to swing into action, working with Cuyahoga and the state to figure out what to do with that. And then $3 million of settlements that were directly infused into various uh, programs. Uh, out of the $125 million, we were required by the courts to set aside a little over $8 million in a common benefit assessment fund to be used to pay uh, legal expenses and attorney fees for the, uh, for the larger lawsuit. Uh, and then uh, that left us with a net settlement of 117. Our attorney fees uh, totaled just under $25 million and there still could be uh, potentially up to another $25 million in uh, costs, uh, litigation costs that come out of that uh, settlement. So right away, our, uh, our cash settlement is essentially reduced to $77 million with the potential to end up as low as somewhere in the, the mid $50 million range. It, when we, to conclude our section, uh, Executive Shapiro is gonna talk about long-term planning and the mm -hmm. idea of uh, trying to make this money last into perpetuity. So here's where I'm gonna kind of crystallize what 15% when we talk about global settlements really means. So our $125 million total, which, uh, which is what I would call pre-tax before everything gets deducted, um, equates to $232 per resident in Summit County, 540,000 residents. To get a, uh, a national settlement, that equates to $232 per resident for every county in the, in the country, the total settlement would need to be $76.5 billion. If we are then going to say that the money that goes to the counties or local government, I guess is more aptly put, is 15% of that national settlement, that national settlement needs to be $510 billion to get everybody to that figure. When we talk about this net, and I'll give you some context of what this net means, where remember I said we could end up as low as 50 some million dollars in net settlement dollars. Our alcohol, drug and mental health board's annual budget is almost $50 million. So it's one year of funding for ADM. If we go to the concept of making this last into perpetuity, that really gives us probably about four and a half million dollars of spending capacity on an annual basis or $8.33 per resident. And that's if you get to the $232 per resident, which yeah. means a half a trillion dollars dollar national settlement to get everybody. There. So I think as much as anything, that kind of crystallizes why Lever working with your states and trying to get more than 15% as a share is so important for all of you. Now, with that, I'll turn it over to Greta to talk in a little more detail about what we've done and some of the issues with product settlement and distributing those. Sure. Thanks, Brian. Um, if, the, if we could advance the screen, please. So as you'll see on this, uh, this slide, these are the four treatment uh, system coordination, evidence-based prevention, education, harm reduction. These are the four pillars that were identified 
by the abatement experts um, who our attorneys brought into our lawsuit, who were recognized by the judge as being able to identify how we had to spend this money because um, we're all talking about how we're spending it on um, combating the opioid, um, just sort of the tidal wave. But I think early on, there was some concern from all sides that this money had to go to this type of treatment, education, those sorts of things, um, so that we didn't see the type of response we had with tobacco litigation and, and the sort of um, downfall of those funds. Um, next slide, please. So as the executive talked about, once the um, original group got together with Executive Shapiro and the mayors and the health um, director, some early funding was identified. Uh, as you'll see here, we had um, $1 million each from uh, the Johnson & Johnson settlement went to our two of our largest healthcare providers to really enhance centering uh, program. We then um, added an additional $500,000. What centering is, is it deals with um, pregnant addicted moms uh, through the baby's first birthday. And there's been a lot of success in our, in our community with that program. So we wanted to enhance that and include uh, one of our FQHCs as well as our county jail in that. Um, we have also invested uh, $1 million in our local community fund. And those, um, that money was broken down into some smaller grants. Uh, we have funded programming that assists dual diagnosis programs. So focusing on addiction and mental illness. Um, we have invested in expanding access to um, MAT certification for physicians through our local medical school. We've also invested in our local children's hospital to provide uh, peer recovery for addicted moms as well. And then additionally, some uh, small grants that have invested in some local grassroots organizations and their efforts um, to combat addiction. It's been interesting um, when we talk about the cash settlements and, and how we're, we're investing that. The biggest investment of time uh, once we had moved from trial prep into uh, the mode of, of managing the settlement was dealing with the medication. As Brian uh, indicated, we had around $12 million worth of product and um, we didn't know what we didn't know when we were like, that sounds great. Uh, let's bring you know needed medications into our community. However, when you don't have a DEA number and you don't have the ability to dispense that, it becomes a real challenge. Uh, added to that was the time frame. Each of the um, three defendants we negotiated the product settlement with were on a time frame. Mm -hmm. um, we had to spend down the medication within two or three years. Uh, we could only make one order per month. Um, so there, there were a lot of logistics to be sorted out that required the assistance of the State Pharmacy Board, which if you've ever dealt with the State Pharmacy Board, it's a real challenge. <laughs> um, so we've, we've done a good job of, of using our partners and our relationships. And, and as Executive Shapiro said, we couldn't have spent one dollar uh, of the medication portion without that sort of teamwork mentality. Uh, but I, you know, I'm happy to turn it back then over to the executive to talk about our overarching themes or our large projects. Thank you, Greta. Um, I, um, one of the things that um, really is troublesome to me is when we look at people who are struggling already with addiction and we, they have to go from one place and fill out a form to another place to fill out a form to transport to someplace else. So when I talk about a holistic approach to delivering services, in addition to the SWOT analysis and all those things that the um, uh, OAAC is going to do, we are going to take a deep dive from a technology standpoint to try and build platforms. There may be partners out there. We'll talk to Matt. Maybe there's some, some of you know companies that do this type of thing um, where we can actually aggregate the information and be able to deliver to a person where they're at, when they need it, without sending them through 87 different hoops just to find out that they may be in the wrong place at the end of time. We wanna get them as treated as quickly as possible, get their information and get them into, into whatever service or treatment they need at the time. So the technology platform will, have, um, uh, will be a large initiative that we're going to take on. But as I mentioned before, Nothing, nothing stays the same. We already know what they're doing out there now. 
And those bad boys and girls out there, they move faster than we can possibly move. So once we figure out what some of these costs are going to be, we plan to create, and we're researching it now, but the plan is to create a foundation, an outside foundation that will we will put some money in over time, probably in tranches, um, that will be charged with um, doing a um, uh Keeping, invent, keeping contemporary with what's going on, looking for new ideas, funding uh, per, uh, new innovative ideas that aren't in anybody's budget but make a lot of sense, following best practices, working with other communities and leveraging that, but also being charged with, I don't know what the time frame will be, every three years or five years going back and doing a full community assessment where are we at? Where are the gaps now? Where do, what do we need to fill in? Because we know a lot of our partners are challenged with the way the money comes down from the state and the feds. So anybody that's interested, we are working through that process now. And um, we have um, a, lot of, a lot of questions to be answered before we do something like that. So what we've done is we've made some uh, investments in the short term. We are building platforms for the future. And then we are also hoping to create something that will throw off an annuity every year to help us stay contemporary and serving the people that we need to serve here in Summit County. And Armin has already talked to me about his investment up in Cleveland. So that's a conversation for another day. Um, thank you. Any questions, we'll be happy to answer. Well, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists. Brian, it's good to hear you again. I know we've talked on the phone a couple times, and uh, I think this is helpful for all of our uh, participants today to, to hear some examples. One of the questions I got when sitting across the table from some of our state representatives at the AG and legislative level is, you know, why do you want this much money, and what are you going to do with it? And... Uh, you know, Did we you ask them we, what they would do with it. No, I'm sorry. Just be <laughs> Well, they told us right away. I'm sure. They, they I'm could sure spend they it better than we can. And uh, <laughs> we, we disagreed on that. But uh, I think anytime we can share uh, what we're doing in our respective counties, uh, and here's two very yep. different examples, uh, it helps us all. And that's what I miss about our in-person, uh, those discussions we have in the hallways or maybe uh, over dinner or over a drink or whatever it might be, uh, of sharing those best practices. And this is a great opportunity to do that. So uh, I'm really looking forward to any questions we might have. Uh, but uh, for our panelists uh, themselves or Matt or others here, uh, questions so far. Mr. President, I just wanted to, uh, again, thank you and thank Director Chase for convening us today for such a timely and informative session. I did want to uh, congratulate uh, both Summit uh, County and uh, Cuyahoga County mm -hmm. for really laying the trail for the rest of us to follow. The lawyers who represented you, the smart work that was done to get the funds to you and what you're doing with it is really a preview for all of us around the United States. We need to pay attention to what you're doing very carefully and understand how you're doing it, how you're engaging with your substance abuse provider communities, the abatement practices, the vast majority of these proceeds going into treatment, prevention, education, to truly prevent this from ever, ever, ever happening again. We're all indebted to you. And I wanted to say thank you so much. The last thing I wanna say, Judge Moore, is we will all not be in such a fortunate position as Cuyahoga and Summit. The amount of money that they got from those structured settlements, one of the panelists talked about it a few minutes ago, I forget who mentioned it, was we are not gonna have a $75 billion settlement. Right. So we will not get a per capita amount that is equivalent to what Cuyahoga and Summit got. That's unfortunate. We should all be in the same position here, but we're not gonna be. So one of the biggest challenges that we all have to accept is that it's not gonna be the amount of money that we're expecting to get here for our communities, but it's gonna be a good shot in the arm and we're gonna do great things with it. But I did wanna temper expectations on the amount of proceeds. Thank you, Judge Moore. Well, thank you so much, Steve. I'm seeing some questions about wanting to PowerPoint and Jenny's already posted it there in the chat box. 
But I want to, and Jenny, if you can put this up too, uh, the, uh, at NACO.org, we do have our research also, research at NACO.org. Uh, I've mentioned before, we've recorded this session today and it will be posted. So if you want to share any or all of what we've done today, that's going to be posted on the NACO website as well. So uh, we also want you to continue to share your plans or your progress that you can discuss publicly uh, with us at NACO. Uh, and that's also at our NACO.org portal or talk to any of our NACO staff about how you might do that so that we can continue to, to share and learn from one another uh, best practices. And, and sometimes it's maybe not a best practice, but it's something we would do differently if we had a do-over. Uh, other discussion. This, we're into general discussion now. Jenny has posted our, uh, our, our, our points there in the chat box. One thing I would judge, if I can, uh, just to second what uh, Summit County and uh, Eileen have said, uh, if you get offered uh, drugs as part of your settlement, think three times before saying yes. Uh, it, was, uh, it was, I can't say it was totally worthless, but it was close to worthless. It, uh, you know, you would think, you know, you're getting millions of dollars offered of drugs. And my thought was, you know, how could it not be usable? Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it's drugs. I mean, we have a, we have a public hospital here in Cuyahoga County, mm -hmm. uh, which we're very, you know, closely partnered with. Uh, but the drugs that we were offered were limited in benefit. Um, and then you've got all the issues that Eileen and her folks raised about, uh, you know, these are, uh, you know, you have, you have your licensing issues, you have your, how do you, how do you distribute it? I mean, you can't even just give it to a hospital uh, without all kinds. Of, uh, so it, it was not easy. It's still not easy. We've got a lot of drugs sitting there. And if anybody wants them, give Eileen and me a call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Executive Budish, another point to that. One of the things we found was some of these drugs, uh, hospitals and organizations didn't want because Medicaid already pays for them. So they were right. really of no value to them. We also questioned when somebody says, here's tw a $12 million drug settlement. Well, how do we know these drugs are truly worth $12 million? I don't mm -hmm. know that we ever got an answer to that, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Executive Shapiro. I was just going to say um, the lessons uh, sometimes that we that you learn from those of us who were out front on this are probably very valuable when you try and translate it into your own communities. Every community is different, um, so I would say take the best of what we have to offer and. If we can give you more information, we're more than happy to do it. But I just wanted to digress for a minute and also mention the importance of NACO and the role that they've been playing in this. And I also have to compliment the role that Matt and his team have done on COVID. It has just been amazing, just amazing. Um, sometimes we just take things for granted and um, that shouldn't be the case. So Matt, heads off to you and your team. Thank you, President Moore. Well, thank you, Executive Shapiro, and uh, they have. Uh, they've been uh, just doing an amazing job, and where would we be without the work that NACO's done over the last, uh, near, well, forever, but uh, <laughs> over, since the pandemic began. <laughs> you know, we all think about when we walked out of the legislative conference in D.C. this past March, early March, and how the world has changed, and Little do we know that uh, we'd be calling on NACO to do all of the things it's done since then. And uh, it's been quite amazing. And uh, thank you to the team. But uh, I'll also remind all of you county officials that are listening in, you are NACO. And uh, it's you, uh, it is your leadership and, and your role in setting policy for our organization and uh, our elections and everything that takes place. So continue to watch for other opportunities that NACO will be bringing you in the coming days and, and weeks, and we are working hard for you. For anyone on the call today on the webinar from West Virginia, I was there with West Virginia, by the way, in person this past weekend. And uh, it's quite an in interesting drive from Charleston, West Virginia back to Kentucky with the storm. 
but the folks in West Virginia are doing an amazing job. Thank you for your hospitality. And uh, I'm just gonna give you a shout out here. Uh, so thank you very much. Matt, anything in closing or anyone else in closing? Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I, I, this met my expectations of what I was hoping we would do. And I think this will also uh, uh, create some other debate and discussion as we go forward. Let's continue to share with one another. And uh, uh, thank you on behalf of NACO. Thank, thank you. you all. all right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks.